you, everybody. And I think in the final few moments, I think um, much of what I'm going to say has already been articulated today. So, but the first thing I wanted to say is to commend to you the work that our task and finish groups have done over the last six months. There's been a phenomenal amount of work done in terms of prevention, but also in terms of early diagnosis, and the living well groups that have actually um, brought to you some really helpful, practical guides on how we can support each age, each part of the, um, the life course. And really what I wanted to talk to you today is, is pretty much, you've, we've heard quite a lot of this today, but it's setting out you know, where we were two years ago. And Paul talked about boiling the ocean. Um, when I first stepped into, I suppose, my first big job, which was in NHS at London as a scientific director, um, I took advice from the medical director, and he said, Fiona, you can't eat the elephant all in one. You have to work out a way of chunking it down and how we're going to do it. So what you've seen today really is the start of that journey. We're probably about 18 months into this, into this piece of work, and we've actually come up some way, but I recognise we've got more to do. So the Action Plan on Hearing Loss, as we know, was launched um, two years ago in March 2015. And as we've talked about, this recognises it's not just a health issue, but it's about the impact of society. And what we needed to do was to have an integrated approach. And I hope that colleagues in this room have seen that actually that's exactly what we've done. We've brought all sectors together, both from ourselves as arms length bodies in NHS England, but working with other government colleagues, such as those in the health and safety executive, but through our professional bodies, the charities, the patient groups, to really all come together to actually make that difference. And we know, and much of this has been articulated, and, and certainly we've been living this over the last 18 months, there's a, there's a real impact of having hearing loss or deafness, both in terms of the, um, the individual, but actually around them as well. Because we know it can lead to isolation and ability to, um, uh, to actually access the services that they require. And much of the work that the, the Living Well group has been done is to really help signpost the support that there's there. We know with hearing loss services, and a lot of this has been articulated, that we still have challenges. We still have people who are not accessing the services for whatever reason that is. It can take up to 10 years before they are actually um, getting, going in to see their GP. We've also heard today, you know, there's still issues in terms of professionals knowing what to do with that patient that's in front of them. There's much more to do around education and training. And we also know that when we actually get into the service, that we've got vari variation in the quality and access of the services. And we know that um, Susan has already mentioned about accreditation as a really key benchmark of quality in our audiology services. And I think from NHS England perspective, we're very clear that's our expectation, that services must be accredited. And this was set, set out very clearly in a statement for, from Sir Bruce Keogh and Professor um, Sue Hill just before Christmas, that diagnostic and scientific services across all the spectrum from imaging, pathology, and from physiology, including audiology, should be accredited. And we're doing an enormous amount of work from the centre where we have contractual commissioning levers, we, we have that within, within the commissioning contracts. But also, and I put this out to my um, audiology con um, colleagues in the room, this is about leadership. This is about the service leaders on the ground recognising that this is what is important for the service. This is how we measure quality and show we are improving. It's about the culture of the services. It's about the culture in those services saying, we take, we, take quality, we take quality seriously, and we're going to improve. This is about a quality improvement agenda. So our response to the challenges set up in the action plan on hearing loss over the last year, we recognised that one of the first things we wanted to do was to set out to our clinical commissioning groups what good looks like, bringing together all that evidence. And again, in a very explicit way, we, we wanted to work with our partners. We wanted to do this in a co-produced way. And we've seen this again through the work we've done over the last year, that actually it's when we come together we can make the, mo the most impact. The commissioning framework was launched last summer. And what it does is to set out a clear guide to the 200 plus local CCGs in terms of what effective commissioning looks like. And as I've said, it was one of the key immediate actions we had to take um, set out in the action plan on hearing loss. 
And what it does is to ensure that local CCGs, and it's great to have some of them are in the room today, said that they've used this, is to say it's their, it, for them to be properly supported to make those informed decisions about their local population. So it's local decision making supported by good evidence. But recognising this is about high quality integrated care so that we are able to reduce the inequalities in the system but make the best outcomes for, pa for the patients that we serve. And we know, and I can't stand up that here and not acknowledge that we know there are some really tough bit decisions being taken by CCGs. We know they're looking at hearing loss services, but we also know that for many of them that have considered this, they've found the, the framework a really useful, helpful document that's brought all the evidence together for them. And many of them have actually made decisions to, to commission their services within that framework. We also know that there are many innovative models out there and actually looking differently and providing these care in a different way not only can actually impact on the patient outcomes but actually can be done within that financial envelope. And our colleagues at NH Improvement have some very clear case studies on this. And the framework gives very clear alternatives to decommissioning services. The evidence is there about what else can be done. So I really, this is about informed local decision making. This is not about us at the Elephant and Castle in, in NHS England. This is about the local CCGs making best use of the evidence that was, that's there. But recognising that the decisions that they're making about those hearing loss services will have a huge impact downstream in terms of both health and social care. And it's about outcome based. So one of the key bits of the commissioning framework was to really understand what good outcomes look like in these services and that I have to say I think was challenging and it challenged all of all of us all of our partners to really bring together what good looks like and what the outcomes would look like but ultimately it's about improving access to a choice of high quality services for the populations that we serve and thinking particularly about how we integrate and how we make those links to other services and again there's more to be done. We're probably two-thirds, maybe a third, halfway through eating my elephant. I don't know where Paul is in boiling his ocean. Long way. But we have made some good strides. We've brought together an action plan over the last year that has started to deliver, firstly on our commissioning framework, and secondly with the guides, the prevention work, the JSNA that you heard from today. There's work that we have done. There's been a mobilisation of a network of champions around this whole agenda. And I think you can't underestimate the importance of that energy and passion to make things, make change happen. When we work together, we really can make a difference. Over the last year, we've done a huge amount of engagement around the commissioning framework, but recognising we still have more to do. And one of the other underpinning groups of our, um, of our work has been a comms and engagement group. And they're working a, a plan on the next 17-18 um, and making sure that we're getting out to the CSUs, to the CCGs, to our STP colleagues to see how we can integrate this work in with them. But our action plan recognises that we need to promote change across all of our public sector services and across the life course. And I hope that you've seen that we've begun to really mobilise around that. There is real commitment for us to work together. Um, and I know when I stood up with many partners uh, uh, just over a year ago and said we were going to do the, the framework in uh, four months, um, I got incredulous looks from them, but every single person rose to the occasion and we were able to, to mobilise around that. Because this is ultimately about reducing um, inequalities in our, in our health sector. And we know that there's no, not one perfect model. And one of the good things about the commissioning framework is it sets out a whole number of um, choices in terms of what would be appropriate for local um, services. But being very clear that this is about having coordination because we have to acknowledge we are still in a time of constrained resources. So just to finish really, we've done an enormous amount of work over the last year there's much more to do, but we know that by collaboration, by working in partnership, we really can make uh, a difference to the patients and the populations that we serve. 
And just a few thank yous, really, to every single person in this room for the support, because I know many of you have been you know, engaged and working hard with us over the last year. Um, to our colleagues that have chaired our task and finish groups, we're working with you now to work out what our next steps into 17, 18 are. And just a final personal thank you to my team, to Sonia and to Sharon um, and Wendy, because honestly, they've made an enormous difference. The long hours, the, um, the, the, the time commitment they've put in over and above has been really quite extraordinary and I don't think we would be here today without the support of um, Sonia and Sharon so thank you everybody um, just a question is this going to be refreshed so the plan is to have an annual refresh of the um, of the commissioning framework. It's a live document. Um, again, the very clear steer I gave right at the beginning, this cannot be a document that sits on a dusty shelf. It has to be live. It has to be used. And again, a real this is about us as champions for this. There's ev the evidence is there. The case studies are there. We all have to be ambassadors and work with our colleagues to make sure that this is, an this is used. But annual refresh in the next, in the next year. So this is pushing, nibbling, lots of effort from all of you uh, together. Um, any specific questions before we close? And um, um, just to warn you, you are between uh, us all and uh, the end of the event. But let I just wanted to say thank you very much. I've very much enjoyed this morning. Um, I have worked in the field of sensory impairment for 30 years now. And I must say... Um, it is becoming more and more difficult now um, to, you know, um, provide services for people with hearing loss, unfortunately. I mean, I think, you know, I've been at the coal face for 30 years, as I say, and I think this is a really, really difficult time where lots of sensory impairment services from social services are being, you know, uh, marginalised, being cut. Um, certainly, I'm working in a local authority at the moment where I started 30 years ago, and they have nothing for people who are hard of hearing at all. And, you know, I, I've gone back there and I've been really quite upset because certainly when I left there t 20 years ago, it was an excellent service. And I, I just think, you know, we really do need to get hold of more commissioners in the room who have a greater understanding of what that means for... Uh, thousands of service users who are living in their communities you know they are really denying them an excellent service thank you so I, th I think the point is well made that again this is not just about the health commissioners but it's also about local authorities and i know we've got colleagues from local authorities today but i think that's the point is about how we take this integrated approach and recognizing that decisions made in the health commissioning sector actually will have you know quite significant impact further down the pathway Hi, I'm Becky Forrow from the National Deaf Children's Society. Um, I think it's really great that you're talking about expectations on audiology services to be IQIPS accredited. Um, but one question I had was about the deadline that NHS England might put on the services it, it actually commissions itself for them to be IQIPS accredited. What, what kind of deadline do you have in mind for that to happen? So I'm not, I'm not going to comment on a specific deadline, but I think it would be fair to say that we are doing a number of things in terms of ensuring that services are IQIPS accredited. There's a piece about making a national expectation, so we've set up very clearly this is the expectation. Well, we have contractual levers, such as that through the 100,000 Genomes Project, where we're actually contractual, contracting. we are pushing that as well. We've also just appointed over the last um, two, three months, since the beginning of the year, um, a lead scientist in, F in, in over 100 organisations, all over 100 providers um, across the country. And that is working with the national network with for me. And one of the big asks of them is to drive accreditation locally. So again, I think there, there's, there's this, it's threefold. There's where we've got contractual levers, it's where we set the expectation, but also it's about leadership as well. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Marlene from the Sensory Team in Redbridge. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, just a couple of comments. Um, really found it useful this morning. Thank you to everybody. Um, accessible information standards, is it working? Is that going to be looked into and reviewed? Because I don't think it's really working in terms in Redbridge. I work very closely with Health Watch. If you have a Health Watch, 
in your boroughs, then I suggest you try and work closely with them to improve things, which is what I've been doing for the past two or so years. Um, in terms of accessible information standards, um, compared, for example, those that are British Sign Language users, compared to the, the professionals that are fully qualified, is there enough for demand? Because that will delay patients accessing services if they have to wait four or five weeks for a qualified British Sign Language interpreter. So will the government be looking into provision compared to demand for communication support? Um, I think okay, it's I'm vital. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank okay. you. Okay, so, so lots of points there. Um, I can't speak for the, the UK government. Um, in terms of, uh, so as of July 16, we know that all organisations should have an accessible information standard. And the, the AIS team are currently reviewing to see actually has it been implemented? Is it working? Is it fit for purpose? And do any of those aspects of those standards need clarifying or updating? And our team uh, within the CSO office is working across there to ensure that any intelligence, any information that we get, it, give is fed in. So again, I think Sonia will be happy to take any comments that we have, particularly on that, as we work across there. Thank you. And our last question. Hi, Rosemary Monk from the British Academy of Audiology. Um, I'm really pleased to hear you say that quality is of great importance here. I know there was originally a task and finish group planned for quality, but that hasn't happened as yet. Can you tell us how you plan to take quality forward, please? So the, uh, the task and finish group on quality is it's, it's, it's data and quality. Yes. Um, so they've started to look at that. I've now got a chair of that group and they're going to be working across all of that. But I think just to recognise that the CSO team has a, 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 a much broader portfolio around all scientific and diagnostic services. So this aspect, particularly around quality, is linked to a broader piece around quality of diagnostic and scientific services. So it, it's absolutely on our agenda. It's part of our priority work into 17-18. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been terrific being here this morning. There seems to be a huge uh, enthusiasm. And yes, progress is never as fast as you want it, but it seems to me that actually uh, you are progressing. It is going forward. Um, thank you to all of you. There, is a, there are the documents uh, at the back of the uh, room if you want to take them with you. Thank you so much for coming, and actually it means an enormous amount to have you all together, all of you, partners in this extraordinarily important enterprise. Thank you very much. Thank you.